Section 2 of The Autobiography of Charles Darwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, June 2009. The Autobiography of Charles Darwin, edited by his son Francis Darwin. Section 2. Cambridge, 1828 to 1831. After having spent two sessions in Edinburgh, my father perceived, or he heard from my sisters, that I did not like the thought of being a physician, so he proposed that I should become a clergyman. He was very properly vehement against my turning into an idle sporting man, which then seemed my probable destination. I asked for some time to consider, as from what little I had heard or thought on the subject, I had scruples about declaring my belief in all the dogmas of the Church of England, though otherwise I liked the thought of being a country clergyman. Accordingly I read with care Pearson on the Creed, and a few other books on divinity, and as I did not then in the least doubt the strict and literal truth of every word in the Bible, I soon persuaded myself that our creed must be fully accepted. Considering how fiercely I have been attacked by the Orthodox, it seems ludicrous that I once intended to be a clergyman, nor was this intention and my father's wish ever formerly given up, but died a natural death when, on leaving Cambridge, I joined the Beagle as a naturalist. If the phrenologists are to be trusted, I was well fitted in one respect to be a clergyman. A few years ago, the secretaries of a German psychological society asked me earnestly by letter for a photograph of myself, and some time afterwards I received the proceedings of one of the meetings, in which it seemed that the shape of my head had been the subject of a public discussion, and one of the speakers declared that I had the bump of reverence developed enough for ten priests. As it was decided that I should be a clergyman, it was necessary that I should go to one of the English universities and take a degree, but as I had never opened a classical book since leaving school, I found to my dismay that in the two intervening years I had actually forgotten, incredible as it may appear, almost everything which I had learnt, even to some few of the Greek letters. I did not therefore proceed to Cambridge at the usual time in October, but worked with a private tutor in Shrewsbury, and went to Cambridge after the Christmas vacation, early in 1828. I soon recovered my school's standard of knowledge, and could translate easy Greek books, such as Homer and the Greek Testament, with moderate facility. During the three years which I spent at Cambridge, my time was wasted as far as the academical studies were concerned, as completely as at Edinburgh and at school. I attempted mathematics and even went during the summer of 1828 with a private tutor, a very dull man, to Barmouth, but I got on very slowly. The work was repugnant to me, chiefly from my not being able to see any meaning in the early steps in algebra. This impatience was very foolish, and in after years I have deeply regretted that I did not proceed far enough at least to understand something of the great leading principles of mathematics, for men thus endowed seem to have an extra sense, but I do not believe that I should ever have succeeded beyond a very low grade. With respect to classics, I did nothing except attend a few compulsory college lectures, and the attendance was almost nominal. In my second year, I had to work for a month or two to pass the little go, which I did easily. Again, in my last year I worked with some earnestness for my final degree of B.A. and brushed up my classics, together with a little algebra and Euclid, which latter gave me much pleasure, as it did in school. In order to pass the B.A. examination, it was also necessary to get up Paley's Evidences of Christianity and his Moral Philosophy. This was done in a thorough manner, 
and I am convinced that I could have written out the whole of the evidences with perfect correctness, but not, of course, in the clear language of Paley. The logic of his book and, as I may add, of his natural theology, gave me as much delight as did Euclid. The careful study of these works, without attempting to learn any part by rote, was the only part of the academical course which, as I then felt, and I still believe, was of the least use to me in the education of my mind. I did not at the time trouble myself about Paley's premises, and, taking these on trust, I was charmed and convinced by the long line of argumentation. By answering well the examination questions in Paley, by doing Euclid well, and by not failing miserably in classics, I gained a good peace among the hoi polloi, or crowd of men who do not go in for honors. Oddly enough, I cannot remember how high I stood, and my memory fluctuates between the fifth, tenth, or twelfth name on the list. Tenth in the list, January 1831. Public lectures on several branches were given in the university, attendance being quite voluntary. But I was so sickened with lectures at Edinburgh that I did not even attend Sedgwick's eloquent and interesting lectures. Had I done so, I should probably have become a geologist earlier than I did. I attended, however, Henslow's lectures on botany, and liked them much for their extreme clearness and their admirable illustrations, but I did not study botany. Henslow used to take his pupils, including several of the older members of the university, field excursions, on foot or in coaches, to distant places, or in a barge down the river, and lectured on the rarer plants and animals which were observed. These excursions were delightful, although, as we shall presently see, there were some redeeming features in my life at Cambridge. My time was sadly wasted there, and worse than wasted. From my passion for shooting and for hunting, and, when this failed, for riding across country, I got into a sporting sect, including some dissipated low-minded young men. We used often to dine together in the evening, though these dinners often included men of a higher stamp, and we sometimes drank too much, with jolly singing and playing at cards afterwards. I know that I ought to feel ashamed of days and evenings thus spent, but as some of my friends were very pleasant, and we were all in the highest spirits, I cannot help looking back to these times with much pleasure. But I am glad to think that I had many other friends of a widely different nature. I was very intimate with Whitley, Rev. C. Whitley, Honorary Canon of Durham, formerly Reader in Natural Philosophy in Durham University, who was afterwards Senior Wrangler, and we used continually to take long walks together. He inoculated me with a taste for pictures and good engravings, of which I bought some. I frequently went to the Fitzwilliam Gallery, and my taste must have been fairly good, for I clearly admired the best pictures, which I discussed with the old curator. I read also with much interest Sir Joshua Reynolds' book. This taste, though not natural to me, lasted for several years and many of the pictures in the National Gallery in London gave me much pleasure, that of Sebastian del Piombo exciting in me a sense of sublimity. I also got into a musical set, I believe by means of my warm-hearted friend Herbert, the late John Morris Herbert, County Court Judge of Cardiff and the Monmouth Circuit, who took a high wrangler's degree. From associating with these men and hearing them play, I acquired a strong taste for music, and used very often to time my walks so as to hear on weekdays the anthem in King's College Chapel. This gave me intense pleasure, so that my backbone would sometimes shiver. I am sure that there was no affectation or mere imitation in this taste, 
for I used generally to go by myself to King's College, and I sometimes hired the chorister boys to sing in my rooms. Nevertheless, I am so utterly destitute of an ear that I cannot perceive a discord, or keep time and hum a tune correctly, and it is a mystery how I could possibly have derived pleasure from music. My musical friends soon perceived my state, and sometimes amused themselves by making me pass an examination, which consisted in ascertaining how many tunes I could recognize when they were played rather more quickly or slowly than usual. God save the king, when thus played, was a sore puzzle. There was another man with almost as bad an ear as I had, and strange to say he played a little on the flute. Once I had the triumph of beating him in one of our musical examination. But no pursuit at Cambridge was followed with nearly so much eagerness or gave me so much pleasure as collecting beetles. It was the mere passion for collecting, for I did not dissect them, and rarely compared their external characters with published descriptions. But I got them named anyhow. I will give a proof of my zeal. One day, on tearing off some old bark, I saw two rare beetles, and seized one in each hand. Then I saw a third and new kind, which I could not bear to lose, so that I popped the one which I held in my right hand into my mouth. Alas, it ejected some intensely acrid fluid, which burnt my tongue so that I was forced to spit the beetle out, which I lost, as well as a third one. I was very successful in collecting, and invented two new methods. I employed a laborer to scrape during the winter, moss off old trees and place it in a large bag, and likewise to collect the rubbish at the bottom of the barges, in which reeds are bought from the fens, and thus I got some very rare species. No poet ever felt more delighted at seeing his first poem published than I did at seeing, in Stephen's Illustrations of British Insects, the magic words, captured by C. Darwin Esquire. I was introduced to entomology by my second cousin W. Darwin Fox, a clever and most pleasant man, who was then at Christ's College, and with whom I became extremely intimate. Afterwards I became well acquainted, and went out collecting, with Albert Way of Trinity, who in after years became a well-known archaeologist also with H. Thompson of the same college, afterward a leading agriculturist, chairman of a great railway, and member of parliament. It seems, therefore, that a taste for collecting beetles is some indication of future success in life. I am surprised what an indelible impression many of the beetles which I caught at Cambridge have left on my mind. I can remember the exact appearance of certain posts old trees, and banks, where I made a good capture. The pretty Panagius Crux Major was a treasure in those days, and here at Down I saw a beetle running across a walk, and on picking it up instantly perceived that it differed slightly from P. Crux Major, and it turned out to be P. Quadrupunctatus, which is only a variety, or closely allied species, differing from it very slightly in outline. I had never seen in those old days Licinus alive, which to an uneducated eye hardly differs from many of the black Carabinus beetles. But my sons found here a specimen, and I instantly recognized that it was new to me. Yet I had not looked at a British beetle for the last twenty years. I have not as yet mentioned a circumstance which influenced my whole career more than any other. This was my friendship with Professor Henslow. Before coming up to Cambridge, I had heard of him from my brother as a man who knew every branch of science, and I was accordingly prepared to reverence him. He kept open house once every week, when all undergraduates and some older members of the university, who were attached to science, used to meet in the evening. I soon got, through Fox, an invitation and went there regularly. Before long I became well acquainted with Henslow, and during the latter half of my time at Cambridge 
took long walks with him on most days, so that I was called by some of the dons the man who walks with Henslow, and in the evening I was very often asked to join his family dinner. His knowledge was great in botany, entomology, chemistry, mineralogy, and geology. His strongest taste was to draw conclusions from long-continued minute observations. His judgment was excellent, and his whole mind well balanced, but I do not suppose that any one would say he possessed much original genius. He was deeply religious, and so orthodox, that he told me one day he should be grieved if a single word of the thirty-nine articles were altered. His moral qualities were in every way admirable. He was free from every tinge of vanity or other petty feeling, and I never saw a man who thought so little about himself or his own concerns. His temper was imperturbably good, with the most winning and courteous manners, yet, as I have seen, he could be roused by any bad action to the warmest indignation and prompt action. I once saw in his company, in the streets of Cambridge, almost as horrid a scene as could have been witnessed during the French Revolution. Two body snatchers had been arrested, and while being taken to prison, had been torn from the constable by a crowd of the roughest men, who dragged them by their legs along the muddy and stony road. They were covered from head to foot with mud, and their faces were bleeding, either from having been kicked or from the stones. They looked like corpses, but the crowd was so dense that I only got a few momentary glimpses of the wretched creatures. Never in my life have I seen such wrath painted on a man's face, as was shown by Henslow at this horrid scene. He tried repeatedly to penetrate the mob but it was simply impossible. He then rushed away to the mayor, telling me not to follow him, but to get more policemen. I forget the issue, except that the two men were got into the prison without being killed. Henslow's benevolence was unbounded, as he proved by his many excellent schemes for his poor parishioners, when in after years he held the living of Hitcham. My intimacy with such a man ought to have been, and I hope was, an inestimable benefit. I cannot resist mentioning a trifling incident which showed his kind consideration. While examining some pollen grains on a damp surface, I saw the tubes exerted, and instantly rushed off to communicate my surprising discovery to him. Now I do not suppose any other professor of botany could have helped laughing at my coming in such a hurry to make such a communication, but he agreed how interesting the phenomenon was, and explained its meaning, but made me clearly understand how well it was known, so I left him not in the least mortified, but well pleased at having discovered for myself so remarkable a fact, but determined not to be in such a hurry again to communicate my discoveries. Dr. Wewell was one of the older and distinguished men who sometimes visited Henslow, and on several occasions I walked home with him at night. Next to Sir J. Mackintosh, he was the best converser on grave subjects to whom I ever listened. Leonard Jennings, the well-known Soam Jennings, was cousin to my Jennings father, who afterwards published some good essays in natural history. Mr. Jennings, now Blomfield, described the fish for the zoology of the beagle, and is an author of long series of papers, chiefly zoological, often stayed with Henslow, who was his brother-in-law. I visited him at his parsonage on the borders of the fens, Swaffham Bullback, and had many good a walk and talk with him about natural history. I became also acquainted with several other men older than me, who did not care much about science, but were friends of Henslow. One was a Scotchman, brother of Sir Alexander Ramsay, and tutor of Jesus College. He was a delightful man, but did not live for many years. Another was Mr. Dawes, afterwards Dean of Hereford, and famous for his success in the education of the poor. These men, and others of the same standing, together with Henslow, 
used sometimes to take distant excursions into the country, which I was allowed to join, and they were most agreeable. Looking back, I infer that there must have been something in me a little superior to the common run of youths, otherwise the above-mentioned men, so much older than me and higher in academical position, would have never allowed me to associate with them. Certainly I was not aware of any such superiority, and I remember one of my sporting friends, Turner, who saw me at work with my beetles, saying that I should some day be a fellow of the Royal Society, and the notion seemed to me preposterous. During my last year at Cambridge, I read with care and profound interest Humboldt's personal narrative. This work, and Sir J. Herschel's introduction to the study of natural philosophy, stirred up in me a burning zeal to add even the most humble contribution to the noble structure of natural science. No one or a dozen other books influenced me nearly so much as these two. I copied out from Humboldt long passages about Tenerife, and read them aloud on one of the above-mentioned excursions, to, I think, Henslow, Ramsey, and Dawes. For on a previous occasion I had talked about the glories of Tenerife, and some of the party declared they would endeavor to go there, but I think that they were only half in earnest. I was, however, quite in earnest, and got an introduction to a merchant in London to inquire about ships, but the scheme was, of course, knocked on the head by the voyage of the Beagle. My summer vacations were given up to collecting beetles, to some reading, and short tours. In the autumn, my whole time was devoted to shooting, chiefly at Woodhouse and Mare, and sometimes with young Ayton of Ayton. Upon the whole, the three years which I spent at Cambridge were the most joyful in my happy life, for I was then in excellent health, and almost always in high spirits. As I had at first come up to Cambridge at Christmas, I was forced to keep two terms after passing my final examination at the commencement of 1831, and Henslow then persuaded me to begin the study of geology. Therefore, on my return to Shropshire, I examined sections and a colored map of parts round Shrewsbury. Professor Sedgwick intended to visit North Wales in the beginning of August to pursue his famous geological investigations among the older rocks, and Henslow asked him to allow me to accompany him. Editor's Note In connection with this tour, my father used to tell a story about Sedgwick. They had started from their inn one morning, and had walked a mile or two, when Sedgwick suddenly stopped, and vowed that he would return, being certain that damned scoundrel, the waiter, had not given the chambermaid the sixpence entrusted to him for the purpose. He was ultimately persuaded to give up the project, seeing that there was no reason for suspecting the waiter of a special perfidy, Francis Darwin. Accordingly, he came and slept at my father's house. A short conversation with him during this evening produced a strong impression on my mind. While examining an old gravel pit near Shrewsbury, a laborer told me that he had found it in a large, worn, tropical volute shell, such as may be seen on the chimney pieces of cottages, and as he would not sell the shell, I was convinced that he had really found it in the pit. I told Sedgwick of the fact, and he at once said, no doubt truly, that it must have been thrown away by someone into the pit, but then added, if really embedded there, it would be the greatest misfortune to geology, as it would overthrow all that we know about the superficial deposits of the Midland counties. These gravel beds belong in fact to the glacial period, and in after years I found in them broken arctic shells but I was then utterly astonished at Sedgwick not being delighted at so wonderful a fact as a tropical shell being found near the surface in the middle of England. Nothing before had ever made me thoroughly realize, though I had read various scientific books, 
that science consists in grouping facts so that general laws or conclusions may be drawn from them. Next morning we started for Langolan, Conway, Bangor, and Capel Keurig. This tour was of decided use in teaching me a little how to make out the geology of a country. Sedgwick often sent me on a line parallel to his, telling me to bring back specimens of the rocks and to mark the stratification on a map. I have little doubt that he did this for my good, as I was too ignorant to have aided him. On this tour, I had a striking instance of how easy it is to overlook phenomena, however conspicuous, before they have been observed by anyone. We spent many hours in Swim Idwell, examining all the rocks with extreme care, as Sedgwick was anxious to find fossils in them. But neither of us saw a trace of the wonderful glacial phenomena all around us. We did not notice the plainly scored rocks, the perched boulders, the lateral and terminal moraines. Yet these phenomena are so conspicuous that, as I declared in a paper published many years afterwards in the Philosophical Magazine, Philosophical Magazine, 1842, a house burnt down by fire did not tell its story more plainly than did this valley. If it had been filled by a glacier, the phenomena would have been less distinct than they now are. At Capel Keurig I left Sedgwick and went in a straight line by compass and map across the mountains to Barnmouth, never following any track unless it coincided with my course. I thus came on some strange wild places, and enjoyed much this manner of traveling. I visited Barmouth to see some Cambridge friends who were reading there, and thence returned to Shrewsbury and to Mayor for shooting. But at that time I should have thought myself mad to give up the first days of partridge shooting for geology or any other science. End of Section 2